School of Education and Counseling colleagues. We may have some of our school partners joining us as their school days end, but I wanna thank you all for joining this November session of our Spotlight on Faculty Research. Um, as you know, sometimes we extend beyond our, um, our network on campus and we invite others who have relevant information and research to share with us. So it's my pleasure today to welcome Jill Pittner um, to our, our screen here and um, let you know a little bit about um, the work that she's doing. So Jill has 20 years of experience working as an educator, a teacher leader, a staff developer consultant and curriculum writer. Jill has been with the National Center for Teacher Residencies since 2011, where she's now the Chief Growth Officer. So in that role, she partners with colleges of education, school districts, and not-for-profits to implement components of the residency model to ensure that children and students in high-need classrooms are taught by diverse and effective teachers. Um, before, she was, before she was at NCTR, she co-developed the Denver Teacher Residency, the DTR, which was the first district-based teacher residency program in the country. Um, Jill comes to us from the University of Iowa, another Big Ten school, um, and a master's degree in linguistically diverse education from the University of Colorado at Denver. Um, now she's currently speaking to us from Silver Spring, Maryland in the Washington, D.C. area. So Jill, thank you for your time today. We're excited to learn more about uh, teacher residencies and, and excited to hear how we might be able to adapt the model in our setting in Northwest Indiana. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And you know, this is one advantage of COVID is like somebody from across the country can just pop into a meeting like this. Um, so I appreciate um, you all having me today. So I can share with you um, some of the learnings that NCTR um, has had from our partners. So this is what the day, um, the next hours or 45 minutes is gonna look like. Um, I'll, I'll kind of bring us all together um, with a welcome. I'm gonna share with you a little bit about my organization just so you can understand like, how do I have the data that I have? Um, how do we use the data? Um, and then just kind of all of us coming together on the residency model so that you know language that I'm using later when we talk about um, the data, we can relate it to the model. And then last we'll unpack some of the research uh, and, and data that we have um, and then leave time at the end for question and answer. So that's what the day looks like. Please use the chat. Um, and we've got some spaces throughout where we can stop and look at the chat. So if you've got questions along the way, go ahead and, and plug those in. So what we're hoping to do today is um, I'm gonna be sharing a snapshot of some of the research um, that exists that demonstrates the impact of the residency model. And, and where I think that situates all of you is to be thinking about what are some of the data you would like to have um, that as you're doing your work in order to think about how to um, serve your hiring districts, schools, and communities better. Um, so I think that having a snapshot um, might spur some ideas, but I also know um, that you all are, are, are in the work and uh, I actually was, um, Got to see the Dave's presentation from last month and, and listen to your conversation about EdTPA. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's a great conversation to continue to have. What could, uh, what could that data, those data, what could the impact be on our own practice? So I just thought I'd start, um, Mary Jane, thanks for the intro. I thought I'd just kind of orient myself to you all. Um, those are my girls, that's Ellie on the left. She's 14 and she's a freshman in high school. So she started, um, we're all virtual here, 100%. Um, and she didn't go to her feeder high school. So she's working virtually to meet all new people at her, um, she goes to the largest school in Maryland. It's called Montgomery Blair High School. There's 3,000 kids at that high school. So she's trying to meet all 3,000, just kidding. Um, and then on the right there is Jane. And um, Janie graduated last spring and was gonna go off to college, but we all decided maybe a gap year would be a really good idea. Um, 
given COVID and um, she also is, she just turned 18 a couple weeks ago. So it was fine for me to keep her home one more year. And uh, she's working at a lab, you know, living in the DC area, we have access to so many things. Um, and so she's actually studying COVID and different um, bacteria and um, viruses. So she's doing some really interesting work um, with the pipette. So um, first and foremost, uh, you know, as I tell you about my girls, you know, I'm, I'm in this work for um, them. You know, they really inspire me um, to focus on equity and um, to ensure kids have other kids have the opportunities my kids have had, um, but we've also gone to very diverse um, schools and I've seen you know, firsthand the kinds of needs that um, students have at schools that are underfunded. Um, so that's my, that's my role as mom teacher. Um, thank you, Mary Jane, for telling a little bit about myself. I started teaching in Chicago. I worked there for three years um, and then moved west. I, I worked in Denver Public Schools for 17 years. I was a teacher, staff developer, mentor, induction coach, um, and all of those things. And then had the opportunity to um, help to launch the Denver Teacher Residency. So as a teacher then, um, I started to teach graduate students uh, instead of the, the PK-12 students and moving towards graduate students um, and being a teacher educator. And all along the way, I, I try to stay focused on learning. Um, and so what I'd love for you all to do, just so um, when, when I, we get to the chat places, um, if you could put in the chat sometime as we go along, your name and then three words that you would use to describe yourself. Um, and I will be checking on those in a little bit. Here we go, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about NCTR. So NCTR, um, we've been around since 2007. We've helped to launch um, over 50 residency programs across the country. We've worked in, or we currently work in 22 states and the District of Col Columbia. Um, and you can see, you know, based on our, our mission and our vision um, is that we're very focused on equity um, and really using residencies as a lever to disrupt inequity. Um, and, and as I share some of the data, uh, you, you will see that, that we are getting, our programs are getting results across the, the country. Um, we, we know what we know um, and, and we love to share what we've learned, um, but meeting with other people, um, doing this work too, um, in different ways, we continue to learn. And um, so I'm really excited to, to have you all kind of um, question and um, share with me during the question and answer time, um, different perspectives. This is our theory of change. And so on the you know, far left-hand side, you can see that our work is to launch and sustain teacher residency programs. So not only have we launched over 50 programs, so what does that mean? That means that we partner with uh, usually a school district or school districts and a college of education to come together to partner to prepare teachers in a residency program. So we created our own curriculum where we guide programs to launch teacher residency programs. And our curriculum is two years to launch. So like a planning year, and then we support people in their first year of launch. Um, and then as our partners, uh, after they launch and they're, and they're implementing their programs, many programs join our network and right now we have about 40 um, partners that we're supporting in our network. And so network membership is, you know, kind of like ongoing professional development and engagement for folks running teacher residencies. Um, and so this really lines up to our mission and our vision. Our goal is to improve teacher preparation um, by implementing components of or the whole residency model um, that we want to prepare diverse teachers um, in certain content areas, and that need is really driven by the district. As our teachers are graduates and go out into the field, um, the great news is they're retained at a higher rate, and the result then is closing the opportunity gap for historically marginalized students. Here's just a quick snapshot of a lot of logos um, of about 40 programs that we're working with right now. 
So we really see the model as a way to disrupt inequity. And as you can see here, um, you know, this is, this is why. Um, this is why many folks around the country are, are starting residencies, because this is um, how we want to prepare teachers to address some of these issues. Retention is such an issue and an issue of inequity because we know that so many of um, students in Title I schools tend to have the least prepared teachers and those teachers who are least prepared um, usually leave at a higher rate. And so um, we want to ensure that the teacher or the students in Title I schools are black and brown students who have historically been marginalized. We want to ensure that they've got the best trained teachers and that the teachers stay. So that's a bit about NCTR and the kind of work that we've been doing. And again, in the Q&A part, if you wanna ask questions or all along the way, feel free to um, include them in the chat. So now what I wanted to do is bring us together to think about the residency model and just to kind of have a shared vision and some shared language as we move through um, the rest of our slides. So um, as you look across this visual here, um, these are the main components of the residency model that we focus on. So first and foremost is partnership. And you, you heard me talk a little bit about this already, um, but that partnership is between school districts, charter management organizations, and the School of Education. Um, sometimes states are engaged, sometimes nonprofits are engaged. And what we do is we bring that partnership together to share a vision about what a day one ready teacher should know and do. You've, we wanna make, ensure that the district has a voice there, but the School of Ed also has a voice. And that collaboratively um, through that partnership, we're preparing teachers to be successful in those hiring sites, in those schools. Um, and so that partnership work is really important. And as we move through the presentation too, you'll see um, that partnership is vital because we, we need to share data uh, across the partnership. So some of the data um, that we'll be looking at, you need to have a school district that says, yes, you can have access to the grads of your program. Um, recruitment and selection is next at the bottom here. In our model, um, we believe in strategic recruitment and selection. Well, we can all say that, right? What does that mean? Um, so it, it's more than a grade point average. Um, and so what we've done is we've looked at certain attributes that are prerequisite um, to effective teachers. And so we've moved those um, into recruitment and selection. Um, so one example is an asset orientation um, to diverse students. And so many of our programs are, um, one way that they kind of um, evaluate that with an applicant is to share district data. And they ask the applicant to respond to the data and to talk about what they see. And from there, you can really start to see um, a, a deficit or asset orientation in that candidate. Uh, we also are, when we recruit and select mentors or cooperating teachers, um, that is a focus of our, our, this is a focus that not only do we want to uh, select effective teachers in the schools um, where we want our candidates to be teaching, but they also have to be able to demonstrate that they have the ability to unpack their own practice, to talk about practice. Um, you know, I, I learned a hard lesson. Um, I placed a candidate with a teacher who was phenomenal, but she could never describe to her candidate the decisions that she was making as a teacher in order to help be the clinical educator that that student, that teacher candidate needed. Um, so, so we've moved that into recruitment and selection, that ability to articulate your practice. Um, the middle there, this is the heart. And this is that integration of the clinical and the coursework um, so that we see that the coursework and the assignments and the learning, the theory and the practice that they're getting in the coursework is lined up to the clinical experience. 
and that candidates have the opportunity to see their their mentors or their cooperating teachers model those practices, um, but they also have the assignments where they are enacting what they're learning in their coursework in the clinical experience. So in the residency year, that's happening side by side. It's not the culminating experience. Placement, that goes back to partnership. Um, it's all about, it's, it says placement, but it really, I, I think that's about hiring. Um, it's not forced, um, but we want to find the right matches for the candidates that they're teaching in schools where they'll be successful. Um, likely schools that are very similar to where we've, they've trained. So those training sites are important too. And induction, you know, um, we all know that, uh, you know, Candidates are on a trajectory and our schools of education and our teacher prep programs, they, they get, they launch those teachers, but those teachers need to end up in districts and in schools will there, where they will continue to grow. Um, and that we need districts to be a committed partner to help um, ensure that teachers grow um, and have the opportunities to continue to grow. I've been talking for a little bit now. So um, given some of the data that I presented, I shared with you our theory of change at NCTR and also just an overview of the model. I'd love for you to um, add to the chat, post any questions that you have right now about the model or what we could, um, some of the research questions that you would want to answer. I'm gonna be quiet for about 30 seconds as you type. Great. All right, I'm hoping that I will um, answer some of your questions along the way, um, but again, we'll have time at the end too. So we are gonna take the time now to jump in to, um, to learn to, I'm gonna share with you some of the lessons that we've learned about the model. Um, lessons that we've learned about how do we talk about the model? What, what are the data we need to collect in order to talk about the model. I'll be really honest, um, you know, when residencies first started, they, they tried to be kind of quiet and um, off to the side and under the radar um, to create some space and time in order for those residencies to be able to collect data and understand, is this working? Is this, uh, is this a good strategy for preparing teachers? Um, and so we're at this point now where, you know, programs have been running some for more than 10 years, where um, we're, we're able to, to share out some data, some longitudinal data as well, um, to look at the model. So um, we're, we're still nascent though, where um, these residency programs are young. Uh, and so today, just sharing, sharing what we know and what we have so far. So, you know, just big picture, wanted to share with you um, how we're gonna go through the research um, coming up and the data. Um, big, big picture, NCTR and our partners are trying to collect data to understand, is the residency program meeting the needs of the partnering schools and communities? And are the residency graduates effective? Really, these are like kind of the two big framing questions that we have as we move through. Um, now, as we kind of unpack, I told you I was gonna share with you a snapshot of data from programs. Um, we're gonna share with you the research questions. Um, what are the indicators that we're trying to measure? What metrics are we using and what are the results? Um, so this is the frame that we'll use going forward. Why don't you all just give me a thumbs up if we're all ready to, to go, to keep moving. Okay, Patrick, you keep your hands on the wheel. The rest of us will keep going. All right, 
So this is partnership. Um, and I, I've talked a little bit about this. One of the uh, research questions that we're trying to understand is, is the residency program meeting the needs of the partnering schools and communities? So some of the indicators that we're looking at is that there's evidence of the recruitment and training practices that target the skills, characteristics, and dispositions desired by the school system. And then another indicator that we look at is that evidence that the hiring needs of the school system match the candidates trained by the provider. So I, I want you to remember those two indicators. You're gonna need them going forward for the next two slides. You with me? Okay. There we go. So <clears throat> the metric that we use at NCTR is we have an annual survey. We distribute that survey beginning in the summer up until right about now. Um, and we are asking programs to share with us the data about their cohort um, and the cohort that has graduated, the cohort that they just recruited and they're now teaching, um, as well as their mentors. So here you can see um, that first indicator, if you'll remember, was are we recruiting and selecting the candidates that our district is hoping for? Um, many of the programs with whom we work are very focused on um, recruiting candidates of color. It is a goal of the district um, to increase the diversity at the district of the teaching force. Sorry, my dog is over there. And so, um, so this is, these are the, um, this is what it looks like for NCTR's partner data. This is our whole network. So these are network averages, you know, approximately 30 programs per year that we're collecting this data from. Um, and so these are the results. Um, so you can see that last year was better than this year. Um, so the, the percentage of residents who identify as people of color has been increasing um, or staying right at, right around that kind of that 50, 55% area, which is very high compared to the teaching core in the country, right? So we know that uh, in the United States of America, 18% um, of the teaching core in the United States identify as people of color. That second indicator, was about, um, are we meeting the district need, their hiring need for content area? And we know that um, you know, many of our districts have shortages for teachers who have, are STEM teachers, special ed. Um, those are perennial challenges across our districts. Um, we also are focusing on teachers who are prepared to work with English language learners. You can imagine that, um, this data is not as clean as we'd love it to be because you might be a teacher who's teaching in Title I, who's a STEM teacher, but who also is teaching special ed students. Um, so, you know, know that um, there is a teacher who, who could be in multiple pie charts here. Um, number one, our programs are responding to the district need to address a retention issue. And so having 97% of the graduates teaching in Title I schools is a great response to teacher retention if we are, if teachers in the residency program are retained at a higher rate. Um, and then we can, you can see in the bottom that they're responding to their district need by preparing teachers in those areas. So this is a network average. Um, we also, so as we collect this data, each program has their own data and they can compare themselves to the network averages. So a program that we work with, um, it's called Project Inspire in Chattanooga. They prepare 14 residents and, that, and they're all STEM, but they're meeting 90% of their district's STEM need. So while that number seems really low, 14 candidates, um, they're meeting their district's need. And, and that's, remember those two big questions we're trying to ask, is the residency meeting the needs of the district and the community? And are the graduates effective? Um, so let's see, my header here says the residency experience. 
Um, to what extent do programs support mentors to be effective during the residency year? So, you know, that mentor kind of translates to a cooperating teacher, right? Um, I also want to share with you that um, that mentor, you know, I talked about them not only being an effective teacher, but they also need to be a co an effective coach. Um, so this question is, do mentors receive support to be effective in their role? We have a stakeholder mid and end year stakeholder perception survey. We distribute this survey at the mid year to residents and mentors. And we ask questions of those mentors and residents about their preparation, about their support, and about their um, feelings, their feelings of efficacy. At the end year, we also survey mentors and residents, but we also we add principals and graduates at the end year. Um, and so at the end year, we collected data and 94% of principals report that their mentors are becoming more effective practitioners. So being a part of the residency model is improving the teachers that are already in the district. And 98% of the mentors also agree that the program is improving their abilities to be a teacher leader. So this is a great investment, not just in, in preparing teachers, but also in supporting the teachers that are out in the district. What is the added value then as we continue to think about this mentor role? What is the added value of hosting a resident in a classroom as measured by teacher effectiveness scores? So uh, I'll say more about that in a minute. Our two indicators are um, evidence that the program is setting expectations for effective teaching for mentors. And the second indicator is that there, ooh, uh, is that there's evidence that the program supports mentor teachers to be able to make visible the high priority, blah, blah. It's, are they able to demonstrate effective practice that has been you know, articulated at the early days with the partnership work. So this is a study that came out last fall and you can see in the center of this slide um, is Glass Frog and they are the research firm that did this study. Um, and you can see when you look at the metric that they needed to be working in states that had teacher effectiveness data and that teacher effectiveness data um, are scores where they could use student achievement scores, principal evaluations, student and family surveys, and teammate surveys. That's how they established these teacher effectiveness scores. Based on those teacher effectiveness scores, um, they compared three, um, three programs. Two are NCTR residency programs, and one was a residency program, but the role of the mentor in this third program, they called it a host teacher. And that, that host teacher did not do any coaching or unpacking of their practice. They were not really in the clinical educator role that NCTR has. So what we found is um, when you look at that first bullet, that in those programs where they were following the NCTR model, that there was a higher teacher effectiveness scores compared to similar teachers in that district who were not hosting candidates or residents. So the cooperating teachers, it being a mentor improved their teacher effectiveness scores. I know many of us are shaking our heads like, of course. Yes, because they're looking at their practice every day, but gosh, it's so great to like have some data that tells us this. Um, and then next, teachers who host, right? But they are not um, taking on that clinical educator role. They do not have greater effectiveness um, when they're hosting candidates. So it is by hosting a candidate, it's not impact, it's not amplifying their results. There's, they're maintaining. And then at the bottom, 
we can see that it did not, again, they maintain, it does not lower your effectiveness scores to host a candidate in your room. I don't know if, if you've experienced this, but our programs have, and I personally have, where you're, you know, you find this amazing cooperating teacher or mentor teacher, but they're very nervous about their state test scores and hosting a candidate and thinking about the gradual release and having a candidate take over. This data, these data are showing us that it actually amplifies the student achievement in those classrooms. Um, so I will, as a follow-up, share that research with all of you. So thinking about the impact of the program, does the residency prepare residents to be day one ready teachers for the hiring district? district? Is there evidence that the candidate has the, not, the knowledge, skills, uh, and dispositions to be effective in that district? So here we went to principals to ask principals. So this is that end year survey. 91% of principals say that the residents are outperforming other teacher pathways. And 94% of principals of our, that are hiring residents say they um, recommend to their colleague that you should hire a resident too. Another way to measure are our candidates meeting the needs is to look at are the districts hiring the candidates we're preparing? So um, this year, 80%, 79.71, so about 80% of the um, graduates are getting hired by the partner district. And then we also look at retention. So um, teacher residencies, um, those graduates of teacher residencies, they are in the district teaching 83% um, of them after three years, which we know that urban districts are at about 50%. Um, so they, they are out, um, outperforming that urban district retention rate. And we see that as a sign of a high quality teacher, one, one who stays and ha doesn't leave the first year or even in the fall of the first year. And now, we're gonna move into some Q and A. Um, I put some questions there, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, so wondering if you wanted to ask questions about the model, um, any questions about the data or the results that I shared. And, um, and then I just thought, you know, listening to your EdTPA conversation, I wondered, you know, if, if you all would wanna open this space to think about what data um, would we like to have in order for us to think about how to um, improve our own work. Jill, this is Julie. I have two thoughts. Okay, hi. So, hi. The, the first thing is, was there um, some kind of study done on um, the, because I know that we have evaluation tools across the nation. In Indiana, we use RISE, which is like Charlotte Danielson watered down. Yeah. Um, sorry, yeah. <laughs> that's my opinion. <laughs> but yeah. but um, is is there evidence that that those individuals that participated in the teacher residency model score higher on those evaluation tools? That is my first question. And then my second question um, is: I know that Indiana offered grants for this program yeah. because we have some of our partners on and some of them will be listening. Is there going to be an opportunity for more funding for some of our partner schools so that we can do this with districts that don't have a lot of money to pay this the stipends and all of that that's required? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so great question. So let's start with your first one about um, measuring teacher effectiveness using a teacher observation. So most of that data is collected at the program level. We, um, we have not figured out a way to collect data like that. Um, so, so we help programs to create program level reports. Um, and I'd be happy to share some of those with you. Um, we have an example of that program. I'll, I'll, um, I'll be bold here and tell you. So in Denver Teacher Residency, the, um, that, that is the program I helped to create. Uh, so in the fall, 
they, um, they measured all new teachers and using the district, they called it the LEAP framework. You know, everyone's gotta have their own thing, right? So um, theirs was called the LEAP framework. And um, so the, the graduates of the residency perform, performed, outperformed every other pathway on the LEAP observation framework. And one colleague's like, what, do you think it's because we kind of cheated and like we used it in prep? And I was like, yeah, that's exactly right. We cheated. We, we helped the candidates demystify what the observation framework was and we aligned the preparation to what they would be evaluated on because we also agreed that it was good practice, right? There, there was plenty more that we taught those candidates, um, but, but that's that alignment and that partnership work where you start to create a shared vision about what teachers need to know and do to be effective. So we have that data at the, usually at the program level. Um, your second question was about the state and the state distributing funds. So last summer, this is how I, I met you all, is um, last summer I was doing a little bit of research with programs that had received money or were planning. And I shared back with the state um, and the state is interested, they were interested in, um, yes, thinking about how to be more strategic with the distribution of money um, because they realized that there was money for the stipend, but not money for programs, right? And for you all to be able to do that work that you need to do. So, you know, when I was working with um, the University of Denver, you know, they granted some of their faculty course release to help to design the program because you've got to, you know, take that course sequence and really shift it in order to align it to the clinical experience, you know, and the cadence of the school year. And so, um, so they got some course release. So I know that Indiana and Stanford Children, we had a conversation with them. There, there's interest um, in, in continuing to fund residencies, but I think that they're, um, they're trying to figure out how to do it beyond just the stipend. Hi there, I have a question if, if I could. Um, this is Patrick and I apologize, I've been off screen, but I've been uh, really enjoying your presentation and, and listening very carefully. <laughs> um, so all your, uh, the different data was really interesting to hear about. I have uh, kind of a question related maybe to the residency model and then more just one I would be interested to just kind of hear your general thoughts. Um, so the, the question was about, you mentioned the, about the model, you mentioned the role of the mentor teacher yeah. and, um, yeah. and, and how they support the, uh, you know, the residents. I was wondering, is there another role there kind of that would be equivalent to like the university supervisor maybe who you know in a traditional program is kind of supporting candidates in the field yep. maybe working with host host or cooperating teachers to some extent but but not to the level you know that you described where it's really providing that um you know like technical assistance to the to the um mentor teachers as well Yep. around you know reflecting on their practice and being good mentors etc um so that was the first kind of question related to the model and then the other one just um more more general you mentioned the the value on that you place on on equity and meeting the needs of these districts for example around retention or particular areas like stem fields and special education and i think often what happens is we have districts that have a lot of need and so when we're trying to identify those uh, mentor teachers sometimes it's hard to find kind of the the homegrown teaching mentors who we can uh, you know who can then mentor our candidates so there's sort of like this i think sweet spot there like where you want to try to find there's already you know you're taking that asset-based approach and you're you're looking at the the experienced teachers within that within that district who can, um, you know, perform that mentoring role. But at the same time, these are high needs districts who you know are already facing like teacher turnover, and so sometimes it's hard, right, to find that support. And so, kind of, how do you, 
how do you balance that if that makes sense yeah it does okay great question yeah, it does okay great okay. question well i can hear myself um okay um, mute yourself okay. patrick thanks there was an echo there so um your first question was about that kind of um supervision role and are there kind of hybrid type models so a couple things I want to share. Um, one is most of our residency programs, um, you saw that strategic placement in the model. There's also strategic placement for training sites. And the goal would be to have more than one candidate at a site. Um, because we really want these candidates moving through this program as a cohort. So, you know, like six candidates at a school would be really great or more. Um, but we know, um, as, as Patrick talked about, that some of our schools don't have the capacity, um, and capacity, I mean skill, um, that they don't, that their teachers aren't yet ready to be mentors. So that is a little bit of a dilemma um, that we can work through. And that's the second question you asked. So I'll get to that in one sec. Um, but one thing to think about for the supervision role, um, what a lot of our programs do is they've created a role that's sitting at the school. And again, think about this as a partnership between the School of Ed and the district. So leveraging maybe coaches that work in the district and having those folks take on as part of their responsibilities to be a site coordinator. The site coordinator role then is to support those mentors because the mentor role is similar to induction, right? Induction role where you're working with novice teachers. So that could be a very large cohort at the district of folks doing induction work, but also working with residents. So that could be a group that's getting professional development together. And the site coordinator role can be supporting that, that group of folks. Provider site-based and they're sitting at the school where they have leadership responsibilities at the school, but they also are providing professional development to those mentors and checking in on the residents. Um, sometimes that role has been um, aspiring principals. So an aspiring principal who's in a building learning alongside another, a, their principal that ho at the host school, they're taking on some of the responsibility of coaching the mentors and doing supervision work. Hard to find mentors was the second part, Patrick, that um, you talked about, and that is a huge issue. Um, I just wanna share with you, we worked with the um, Duval County Public Schools and University of North Florida. Um, Duval County Public Schools has a lot of teacher data. So what we did is we sat down and we looked at the teacher, teacher data and we, um, the focus of their program was STEM, middle school STEM teachers. So we looked at all of the data for their middle school STEM teachers, and we looked at who was effective and who's been teaching for at least two years. And that is how we started to identify schools where we could place candidates. So rather than having them just any teacher candidate apply to be a cooperating teacher or a mentor, we actually targeted those teachers that had strong effectiveness data and, and who had been in the field for a little bit. Um, another program worked on professional development first with the district. And so having teachers work on their own practice first and then move those folks into cooperating teacher or mentor roles. Thank you. You're welcome. Jill, I think one of the most exciting things about your presentation today is, is opening up the possibilities. And I especially appreciate how you've shared um, these specific research questions. And um, as I look to my colleagues in the School of Education and Counseling, I'm wondering if, um, if, any, if there's any of these research questions that are interesting or pique your curiosity or, um, and I know Patrick, you can't see them for now. So this, we may have to carry this conversation on um, at a different meeting, but, you know, how uh, do schools of ed, you know, kind of pick up a research question or two and, and start there and jump in. And I'm, I'm, you know, looking to, again, to some of my colleagues to say, you know, what, where would, where would we be able to start? Where, where are we in this process? I 
I think that the one thing that we um, have done is we have been able with our professional year to create that year long experience in a district. And we have had six to 10 students in a district, which um, has been really great. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, I think that the area that we really need to work on, which is difficult is more support for our mentor teachers because they will only do what they are bound to do by contract. Um, many of them come to meetings out of the goodness of their heart because they want to support our candidates. But as far as professional development um, with those teachers, even the promise of PGP points is not enough. Yeah. Um, and especially not right now with everything that they're doing. So, um, so I, I would say that that's one opportunity for us. Um, I think that um, the other thing, and this is a question for Jill, how do you recruit to your program candidates who identify as people of color? Because I'm sure everybody everybody wants that but but so many of our schools that's one of the first questions they ask me when i'm negotiating with placement i want my staff to mirror my student population more closely um and and everybody in the teacher program looks like me or hadassah you know or amanda <laughs> so yeah, um, so we have a, a paper that just uh, came out last month and it's, I think residencies are a vehicle uh, for recruiting and selecting candidates of color. Uh, and, and a couple of the lessons learned from our partners is um, that candidates are looking for a rigorous program, um, that they're not looking for a shortcut to be trained quickly, that they are actually very excited about hearing that this is a rigorous program. They, they want the best. They, and the reason why they want the best is most of the candidates of color um, identify that they are, you know, really mission driven, that they want to serve a community, usually a community uh, that is similar to one, uh, either it's their own community or similar to a community um, that they were raised in. And so um, really thinking about recruiting in the community um, and, and thinking about paraeducators, PTA. Um, so these are all folks that are already kind of working with youth in the community. Um, and so those are, those are great places to go, are people who share the mission um, to serve a certain community. So, you know, there, then there's thinking about, um, you know, everyone's talking about grow your own. Um, we are working with uh, different teacher prep programs around the country to, a, a, as a way to think about grow your own is, is really to develop a pipeline into your teacher prep program. So one, um, we're working in Worthington, Minnesota, and it is a very diverse district um, where it's, it's, I think it's 70% diverse. Um, students of color and 80% of the teachers are white. And so they really want to address this disproportionality between the teachers, race and the students. And so um, they are looking at dual credit for high school students to start to create that pipeline. So that goes all the way back to that slide and that partnership. Um, and that, you know what, we, we might not have a quick fix to developing this pipeline and it might be a long-term partnership with the district. Um, so this partnership then, those candidates or those high school students are getting dual credit. They're able to use that dual credit at a community college. And then Southwest Minnesota State, um, that's our, our like kind of lead client there. We're working with them to design the program that builds off the community college and partners with the community college to move them into the university so they can get their bachelor's and participate in a residency in Worthington School District and get their license. Um, so it's just going like a little bit longer, a little bit deeper. Um, we know that the value proposition uh, means a lot. I'm, I'm sure that you all know that 
offering the stipend means a lot to folks um, because some of them are career changers. Um, and so we, we need to create positions and ways for them to transition to teaching. Uh, one of our partners has an agreement with their district that the residents in their program are the special ed paras. And so they every year take on the special ed paraprofessional roles and they're doing very well in those roles. Um, and so they've got this constant pipeline um, of teachers coming into the district or candidates, sorry, well, teachers and candidates, the residents then are taking the para role and getting paid, um, but they don't have a full para load. So they have the opportunity to still teach and learn alongside a mentor teacher. So that's one way to have folks to meet the school's need, the district need, but also to attract folks into teaching where we can pay them a living wage or, or a wage. Jill, thank you so much. This is really exciting to think about. And I think Julie's hit on something that um, that is really exciting to me. And I, I know we want to continue the conversation within our School of Ed, which is that many of the elements that you're talking about where we've dipped our toes in and some of these were, you know, kind of up to our knees in it, but I think we're ready to, to get more fully immersed. So I look forward to continuing the conversation with you and NCTR um, and with my colleagues at the School of Education. I want to shout out to Dan Kozlowski. He's here with us um, as part of the Archdiocese of Gary, so the Northwest Indiana Parochial Schools and a partnership that they have with the Big Shoulders Fund um, to really make a difference and an impact in our diocese schools. And I, I think there's some opportunity there. So Dan, stay tuned because we'll be talking to you some more and, um, and we'll tap into Patrick's expertise and his experience. But um, again, Jill, thank you so much for your time this afternoon and to everybody for taking a, this hour out of your day to think a little bit more about how we can work with children and families in our community and to really train these um, effective educators. All right. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And I'll share um, the PowerPoint with you all on some of the research that I, I talked about along the way. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm.